What's the word, y'all? The Carl Anthony Towns, Julius Randle, Dante DiVincenzo trade happened about 20 hours ago. And a lot of the times when we see a big blockbuster trade, I get down to my filming room and I give my knee-jerk reaction. This is what I think for the now. And I always say that my opinions might change as I think about it a little bit more. Well, my opinion has changed just a little bit and I thought it was enough for me to record a video. So let's lock in. I like this a little bit more for the Minnesota Timberwolves today. I hated it yesterday. Absolutely hated it yesterday. And today is starting to make a little bit more sense. I still don't believe it's a great trade, but I, I do think it might have been a necessary trade. And, and hear me out. I still don't like that they did this to Carlton Towns with him basically being blindsided. There was an article that kind of went through the, the process of all of this where before it was announced, um, Tim Connolly and the people over that are in charge of the Minnesota Timberwolves went to Carthony Towns' house to tell him personally face-to-face -face that this was happening, which I do respect to a certain extent, but he had no idea before that that he was even on the trade block or the conversation was going on. So um, also other articles are coming out about all of the, the community work that he did in Minnesota since he become, uh, became a Timberwolf. So again, I still don't like that aspect of it, but the business is the business. And sometimes you have to make sacrifices, as stupid as it sounds. Now, in our first iteration of this, we talked about it being um, a thing from, from ownership, talking about the team being too expensive, them not wanting to be a luxury tax team or something like that. That's, that wasn't necessarily the case. The reason they made this trade was because their team was going to be in such in a financial bind with the Carl Anthony Towns contract, again, the eighth most expensive player in basketball, the Rudy Gobert contract, which is a max, the uh, Anthony Edwards extension, which is a max, and the Jaden McDaniels big time extension, was, which wasn't a max, but close to a for a role player. And then they also had Nas Reed sign his extension. So the idea that we all thought of let's run it back one more season. Let's see what could potentially happen if you take this team that was just in the conference finals that defeated the defender champions as running back one more time. Or running it back one more time would have meant that they lost Nas Reed and they lost Nikhil Alexander Walker after the season. It was a risk that they didn't really want to want to take at the end of the day. And we got all of these new implications with the second apron and stuff like this. And and it seems as though these team these people that are in charge of building these teams are not wanting to go to be a second apron team if they don't truly, truly believe that the core that they have built is going to win a championship. And basically what this is telling me is that Tim Connolly and stuff saw that, yeah, we made it to the Western Conference Final, but we do not believe that this year, the way we have constructed this roster is good enough to maybe get over a Dallas Mavericks if we win against them again, or eventually go against the Boston Celtics or whatever team might come out of the East. Because way, the way Nas Reed's contract is set up, he is making $13.9 million this year, and he's got a player option for $15 million next year. The way Nas Reed just played last year, that $15 million is nothing. So yes, if they would have ran it back and failed, that that would have meant they would have lost Nas Reed, who again is another fan favorite, and also lost Nikhil Alexander-Walker, who at one point was a throw into a trade, and now is like a part of their core rotation. And and I have to, I have to take a step back because I always criticize teams that make trades and make moves a little bit too late, right? I hate what the Chicago Bulls have done over the last couple seasons because it seemed like they wait until the very last moment to make a trade. And maybe this is them being proactive rather than reactive in a way, right? We're not going to wait until the last possible minute to trade away Carl Anthony Towns. We see a trade that we believe could either help us still be somewhat competitive this year, but also build a future for Anthony Edwards. Again, I don't love, I still don't love it. But I, I can talk myself into understanding it just a little bit more today than I did yesterday. Because with this trade, with Dante DiVincenzo's contract being a little over $11 million and Julius Randle's contract, this saves them about $10 million this year, but also opens up an insane amount of flexibility for the next season. It gets that flexibility to give Nas Reed whatever contract he might be worth after the season. And if you're going to make this decision, right, you're going to make this decision to blow up a core that not just your fans love, but the casual NBA fan, I'm pretty sure fell in love with this team after last season when you have Anthony Edwards going in that run and the Carthage Towns having a big game seven versus the Denver Nuggets and everything. If you are going to do this, you want to do it by also getting good talent in the door. And Julius Randle is a very, very good basketball player, right? I, can we agree on that? Like, I know the conversation kind of shifted around Julius Randle because of his injury, because of the, the one playoff or the playoff series that he had, that he hasn't been good or whatever. Julius Randle is a good player. Like, I like that we traded away the talent. Carthony Towns, I think we can agree Carthony Towns is a better player than Julius Randle. But we got back, like, quality, real players. A lot of the times, if you're going to do something like this, we trade away a dude, and we're not getting a real dude back. We're getting the idea of a dude. We're getting the future draft capital. We got a guy. 
and Julius Randle, who at this point might be underrated. I even said that in my video before he was a Minnesota Timber. Go watch my New York Knicks video. I said that he might have become over underrated based on the conversation that's been around him because the Knicks were so good when it was just the Nova Knicks and Jalen Brunson had the highest usage rate in all of basketball. He had become underrated, and now you went all NBA talent for all NBA talent. Again, I think Cat is here and Julius Randle's here, but still. And then there was a lot of conversations with, with me as well when we talk about the spacing. And I, I don't know. I don't know. There, there are a few words across basketball um, that I think we just say are buzzwords, right? Um, point of attack defender, portability. Um, what, what's, what's some, there's a lot of them in basketball, and spacing has become one of them, and I'm guilty of it. You go watch my video from yesterday. I'm guilty of it, talking about the spacing. I just went back today. Again, it's been on my mind all day, and just rewatched a bunch of Julius Randle alongside Mitchell Robinson. He played with Mitchell Robinson for the last couple of seasons. Mitchell Robinson is a worse offensive player than Rudy Gobert. I don't even know how the hell that's possible. He's a worse offensive player than Rudy Gobert, and yet they coexisted pretty damn well. Actually, I think I have the stats. So this is their last full season playing together. So this is 2022-2023. Again, Julius Randle got injured in, what, January last year? They play 1,300 minutes together. They had a net rating of 7 and an offensive rating of 121.8. Julius Randle and Mitchell Robinson, a lob threat, rolling, screen setter, no offensive back center, still had an offensive rating of 121. That was last year, or not last year, the season before last year. And last year, they had an offensive rating together of 117. And that rating ain't that great because their defense wasn't as good with them two together um, last year versus the year before that, but still a, a 17.9. And that 121 from two seasons ago would have had them be like the number two offense in basketball. Obviously, it's a way smaller sample size than an 82-game season for these dudes, but even at 117 would have put them, what, what number is that? That would have put them at number 11, 10, 11, 12, 13, so middle of the pack offensively, which is pretty damn good. So like we talk about the spacing and so on and so forth, Julius Randle has made it work before with a center that that job is set screens and catch lobs. So I'm liking it a little bit more today than I did yesterday for some of those reasons. You also got the Dante DiVincenzo piece. Like one of the things I saw a lot from Knicks, like I've seen a lot of Knicks fans over the last 24 hours. I feel like half of them love this trade. The other half of them hate this trade. But a part of the people that hate it is like, man, we gave up Dante DiVincenzo and Dante DiVincenzo was our best three-point shooter last year. He had so many moments, so on and so forth. Well, having that for the Minnesota Timberwolves is actually going to be pretty big. There's a report from Ian Begley. Let me bring it up. Dante DiVincenzo reportedly didn't like the idea of playing a reduced role with the Knicks. DiVincenzo is probably going to be coming off the bench this season. Bridges would likely have taken a spot in the starting lineup. I can say confidently that DiVincenzo didn't exactly love the idea of playing fewer minutes slash a reduced role this season. He was coming off a career year and helped the team win a ton of games when it was shorthanded. Um, and when he goes to Minnesota, I mean, it's not like he's going to be ushered into the starter lineup for, a, I mean, there's a world where he could start a little bit, but his role would be increased with the Minnesota Timbers versus with the next year of the Knicks. Because I'm looking at this team and I'm seeing Uncle Mike being 37 years old going into next season and just kind of realizing that uh, the writing is on the wall that eventually he will not be a starter quality point guard. And they drafted Rob Dillingham last season to kind of help that. But it might take Rob a little bit of time to become a quality NBA player. And Dante DiVincenzo back in college at least ran a bunch of one. Um, so there's a world where Dante is starting alongside Anthony Edwards eventually as that backcourt. Um, I don't know how I feel about that necessarily, but with him being a 40 plus percent three point shooter and show you that he's got the cojones to take the big shots when necessary and also is a plus defender like that is I, I said it. I think I said it yesterday that I was more excited about Dante DiVincenzo being a, a, a Minnesota Timberwolf versus Julius Randle. And I still, I think I still feel that way today. Like that's how impactful of a player Dante was for the Knicks last year. And listen, there's nothing like watching actual footage, like full games. But if you want to take a sneaky route to like just watch some possessions of two players playing together, the high low got it where I typed in, I want to see uh, Mitchell Robinson and Julius Randle together. As you can see, a lot of these are basically Julius Randle causing the diversion, get it to the rim, putting pressure on the rim, dishing it off to the dunker spot, which is Mitchell Robinson. He even threw a wink in there. You saw that wink? I don't see a world where this is something he can't do with Rudy Gobert. Also, you got this offensive rebound. You know that's what Mitchell Robinson does. Step back. J Julius Randle is a shelf top shot taker and a tough shot maker. Again, it hasn't translated well in his few playoff appearances, but this right here, oh my God, this right here is something that we can see all, all damn day for them. Guard up top, Uncle Mike, Anthony Edwards, who probably Anthony Edwards because he's such, such a threat. We bring these screens up super, super high here and watch, watch what they do. Boom, Julius Randle. Easy. Make them make that decision. Like, I, I do believe that because Randall is a five assist per game player, that he can make it work with Rudy Gobert. And it might be clunky to start off with. Let's be real. It might be clunky to start off with. 
Um, but it, I think it could eventually work. What I don't like, again, is that it changes their ceiling on this season. I do not believe that this is a team that can go out there and win the championship this season. I feel like that's fair to say. But it also elongates what their window could be. But this is like a real big bet on Tim Connolly on himself to even find another person to bring in for Julius Randle eventually um, or trust that his draftees over the last couple of seasons eventually take a step up. There's also a huge, huge bet on Nas Reed. There's a report that Julius Randle is probably not ready for the season opener, which allows Nas Reed to get that start in power forward minutes and really get a chance to, to show who he could be as a starter in this league. And I do believe there's some fun lineup combination. I, I'm talking myself into, again, not necessarily liking this trade, but liking it more today than I did yesterday. Like there are some fun lineup combinations where it felt like last year, and I don't have the numbers to prove this, that it always had to be um, Gobert plus one of the guys. And actually I don't have the numbers, but I know for sure this is not the case because Kyle Anderson was running some four for them last season. But a lot of times it was either uh, Carl Anthony Towns or Nas Reed on the court together. This opens up the possibility where really is Rudy Gobert as a true five man and to just have ultimate amount of space and would it be in Uncle Mike, Dante DiVincenzo, Anthony Edwards, and and um, da Jaden McDaniels. That's a pretty interesting lineup. You can see if you have Nas Reed and Julius Randle sitting on the bench and then boom, now you got another lineup where it's Julius Randle and Nas Reed together. Like there are a lot of combinations. They got a good coaching staff to maybe make it make sense. Unfortunately, again, it, it might take some time. And time is on their side, but it's also not at the same time. And the reason I say it's on their side because Anthony Edwards is, what, a 23-year-old superstar? But also their center who just won DPOY is now 32 years old. I have to look it up. He's now 32 years old. So how many more years do we have of Rudy Gobert being one of the best defensive players in basketball? Because it's not forever, right? So this does shift our window from being a championship contender this year to the future maybe, but how much in the future can you afford a Rudy Gobert being on this team? Because they, I feel like they figured it out, right? They figured it out with the point guard. Uncle Mike is probably going to be going eventually, and now we got Rob Dillingham slash Dante DiVincenzo for that. They don't really have that answer unless the answer is Nas Reed is now our full-time five in two years or three years, and Rudy Gobert is aging out of the league. I don't think my opinion about the Knicks side of things have changed that much. Like, I still do like it. Um, I, I, I'm waiting for somebody who is a, a cap expert to kind of explain it to me how long of a window they have with this core because you think about again uh, Jalen Brunson took that contract and it's a lot less than what he's probably worth but they gave OG Ananobi that max Carthony Towns is on the max Mikhail Bridges' contract is up after this season or next season if I'm not mistaken so like eventually those cap implications that hindered the Timberwolves from staying together will hit the Knicks and I just don't know when that window is. I got to wait for somebody that's way more knowledgeable than me to put that article together or make the video about it. And one of the comments I saw a lot on the video that I dropped yesterday was like, okay, Kenny, does this, does this change where the, the Knicks are like in the hierarchy of the Eastern Conference? And I'm going to say no. I still think that with Carthony Towns, they're a tier two team behind the Boston Celtics, but it only takes a, a good tier two team and some luck to go on a deep run, right? And I think that's, that's something that could happen potentially. Like everybody, y'all got to think about it like this. Everybody on Twitter is talking about, oh man, y'all traded away this and we can't wait to see y'all. These are opposing teams in the Eastern Conference. We can't wait to see y'all because this guy match up well with this guy. This guy match up well with this guy. How many series did we get last year where both teams were completely healthy? It is a dog fight of, of what is it, attrition? Is that the word? And health. So we, we have these fictional lineups and, and matchups, and at the end of the day, we're going to get to the postseason. It won't matter because somebody's going to be out. Somebody has an high ankle sprain. Somebody might have a cold or a stomach bug or the BG. Like, you never really know. So it's hard to really put it on the one-to-one -one scale, but based on roster construction, I still have the Boston Celtics number one, and I think the Knicks are in that tier with the 76ers. They're in their tier with the Bucks. So I just saw that Chris Middleton just had, had a procedure. We don't know if he's going to be ready, so we'll see about that. But they're in that second tier of team, and I think that's okay. Second tier can win a championship. I hate when people have conversations about players and just shit on them all day. Y'all going to turn me into a Julius Randle fan. Because, <laughs> again, Carly tells us better. Ob objectively, in my opinion, Ob objectively. But the way they was talking about Julius made me think like, damn, have we not watched him for the last couple seasons? Like, yes, the body language can be absolutely awful. I completely, completely agree. Hell, he takes some really tough shots and when they miss him, it's awful. He can turn the ball over a good amount for sure. But the core of Julius Randle is an all-star. The core of Julius Randle has been all NBA. 
let's not act like he's a bum because he's far from that. He's far from that. So um, I didn't love the trade yesterday. I don't love it today, but I like it a little bit more.